Hey guys and girls, today we are jumping on live again with our buddies over at Austin Barbell. Um, we will be talking uh, a little bit about do's and don'ts of coming back to weightlifting. Uh, they're already on here, let's go ahead and get them on. So that connect. It's kind of like the idea of returning to weightlifting after uh, COVID and all that. So that's kind of what we're going to be chatting about. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for doing this again, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. We had so much fun last time. It was yeah. it was it was hard to turn down. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. I'm glad. Um, so uh, we were chatting a little bit, and I think kind of a, a good topic at hand right now, as gyms are kind of reopening and uh, people are kind of getting back onto the platforms, is to just kind of talk a little bit about returning back into weightlifting um, because for a lot of people they took probably a minimum of you know two months off and then I mean outside of Texas there's gyms that are still shut down so there's gonna be people probably taking upwards of four or five months off of weightlifting maybe doing some other stuff in the meantime but probably not really getting under a barbell as often as they could right. so I thought this would be kind of a good time to jump on here and kind of talk about uh, maybe what the athletes should be looking forward to, um, kind of what they should be expecting when they're coming back into the gym, and uh, and a, and a safe way of like reapproaching that for not only the athlete but maybe for some coaches out there too. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think for the lucky ones, you know, that had an opportunity to build a home gym, you know, yeah. they were able to keep training or training at a a, a lower intensity without a coach or remote programming. Mm -hmm. You know, that that all works. Um, from what we've seen, and, and most of my athletes that are coming back into the gym were only off for maybe two and a half, three months or so. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, not that long of a hiatus, but if you're coming back into it, you know, one of the most important factors to consider is that your strength is going to return pretty quickly, typically yeah. before you can develop any sort of, um, you know, like ligament strength or strength within the joints themselves to support, you know, the weight that you're going to put above head. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, we've been doing this slow ramp upwards for those athletes that are coming back so that, you know, we don't want to, we don't want an injury. It's just yeah. like, it's just as if you were just coming into the sport almost for the first time, but now you've got technique and you've got a background or foundational, you know, base and strength yeah. itself. So yeah, you, you can actually, you, you'd be surprised how quickly, I think a lot of athletes would be surprised by how quickly they can actually get back to some of their old numbers. Absolutely. So like you said, and what a lot of people maybe don't realize that, the the joints the ligaments and all that it's that's a much slower process it doesn't recover at the same rate um as muscle does and so you have to kind of factor in the fact that you haven't had this mm -hmm. type of weight overhead in a long time and even though your muscles might be ready to do that within the first couple of weeks i mean yeah you're absolutely just kind of setting yourself up for you know uh my my elbows are flaring up my shoulders are flaring right. up and all that kind of stuff yeah and, you know, there's a lot of athletes. I mean, our, our, our base at our club, I mean, we range in age from, you know, 12 years old all the way to, you know, almost 60. So, yeah. you know, it's a case by case. Mm -hmm. know, but at the end of the day, you need to take a slow ramp no matter what the age is. That ramp may be slower for those that are, you know, 35 and up than it is for, you know, a senior athlete that's, yeah. you know, that's ready to compete at AO. Um, it's, it's been interesting, you know, not only because of this long break, but there's been sort of this recalibration of programming that we've had to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the athletes that were able to train at home. Many of them were sort of like an, on this idle program with subtle spikes just to kind of help them along, make sure they're improving. But, you know, there was no competition dates that were really, you know, published and, yeah. you know, we're, we were just, you're we just hoping for something to, come, <laughs> to pop up on the calendar so that we can start targeting something. Um, and, and it looks like that time is here. So yeah, I'm yeah, excited. yeah. I've only been programming, you know, usually I kind of have the meat set in mind mm -hmm. and I program back from that and, uh, you know, and then make some changes along the way if, right. if you know, so, so on a kind of a week to week basis, kind of reevaluate, all right, we got to mm -hmm. change this percentage or drop a rep here. But for the most part, I always have kind of this template leading up to the next meet and, uh, and just not having that, um, you know, has thrown things off a little bit, but it's also been a little bit interesting. You know, I've kind of had fun being able to play around with, all right, 
We're, I, so I've only been doing four weeks at a time. All mm -hmm. right, here's the next four weeks, you know, and, and not really having that insight. It's kind of changed up the way that I program a little bit. But I think it's exactly what you said, though. It's made me also be a little bit more conservative. I know that we're not coming up with something really, really soon. All right, what, is, what are some things that I can work on that we usually don't maybe have the time frame? You know, if we only have a 12-week cycle, you got to kind of right. ramp up pretty quickly. But when we've got 25 weeks, 30 weeks, you know, we're like, okay, we can really spend some time on rehabbing the joints mm -hmm. and getting the body feeling good, maybe sneaking in some GPP there, you know, right, right. stuff like that. Yeah. 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 We've been taking a similar mindset. You know, generally when I program, the, the way that I look at it is, you know, I already know what the curve is going to look like as a pr approach competition. Yeah. Now we're just looking at the various exercises that are within that. Uh, within those blocks and then programming on that week to week because there's always changes, you know, like, yeah. like you yeah. mentioned, my, my elbows are flaring up or, you know, they develop training scars and then, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they're, they're dipping and they're jerking correctly. So now we got to reassess and focus on that so that mm -hmm. we can make sure that they're ready for the platform. So it's always this kind of like recalibration. I call it tactical programming because we're always, mm -hmm. you know, day by day, we're evaluating, we're taking notes, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to move the athlete forward in a positive manner. Yeah, I like that tactical programming, <laughs> you know, got to be ready for change at any point. Right, yeah. right. I, I mean, I think it, I think in a perfect world, you know, for if you look at like all the older Russian sports science, you can see that, you know, they plan out a year in advance. And yeah, those are for athletes that have been doing this for, you know, they've already got those fundamental basics, they have no flaws within their you know, within their technique and they can just, you can just give them a piece of paper and just like a computer, they'll just run because the yeah. hardware, the hardware is already like optimized. The software is the yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a, you know, that, that was interesting. That was something that I was talking, this is a little bit of a sidetrack. I was talking to somebody else about um, Megan from uh, winner's win. And we were talking about how, um, how different it is too with uh, the majority of the athletes that we get probably in the U S because most of our athletes are um, people that played other sports in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, still a majority of them are senior to master's athletes, you right. know, not as many youth. And so we have to, we have to do a little bit of everything every single time that they train. So we have to work on the mobility. We have to work on the technique and we have to make sure that we're building strength because we might only have this small time frame for these athletes mm -hmm. Whereas somebody that comes up through the system at a youth age, you know, they can spend a majority early on. They probably don't have mobility deficits to begin with, but they can spend early on developing the technical side of things. So that way later on, you can almost primarily focus on the strength increases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you just have years on top of years of kind of like what you were saying. Then you can almost be like, all right, your technique's great. Now we just need to get you stronger progressively. And then you just kind of continue to build that strength side of it. Whereas with what we're working with is, all right, we got to work around old injuries. We got to work right. around, you know, we still got to work on your mobility. I know you want to get stronger as quickly as you can, but we also have these deficits where we're trying to do everything all at once. So, so, I mean, that's absolutely true. So, I mean, based on what I've seen in sports schools, you know, throughout the world, mostly in China, is that they, you know, that foundational uh, technique work is done at a very young age. Most mm -hmm. kids at the age of eight are just working with a pipe. You know, they're working on technique and they're just learning how to move correctly. And they make yeah. games and they try to make it fun. And as they start getting closer to puberty, they start working more on strength related exercises. Um, still technique focused, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, those, those children already know how to move. So yeah. Yeah. in this country, when we start getting athletes in from other sports, it could be anywhere from powerlifting, CrossFit, soccer, football, you know, they may be coordinated in those sports, but they need to learn how to adapt. So we approach almost all athletes, if, unless you've been in the sport for a number of years as children. Yeah. So, cause we're trying to throw everything at them at once, you know, technique, mobility, strength, um, and then they have to learn how to compete, which is, you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. also, that, that's also another, you know, piece <laughs> of the pie. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had, I've had e extremely strong people come to the gym, well coordinated, and then they get on the competition platform and it's, yeah. you know, it, they fall apart. So, yeah. um, 
Yeah, it's, it's a different mindset altogether. Um, you know, one of the things I enjoy is the fact that every athlete is different and that we're mm -hmm. just not taking this template and applying it to a person and then, you know, expect greatness in six and seven years. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's the, that's the beauty of like the difference between like some of the, the online training, you know, mm -hmm. you know, where you just go and you just buy a template and you just follow it and which again is, is not a bad approach if it's something that gets somebody into weightlifting. Mm -hmm. you know fine by me because uh, eventually they'll probably hit a limitation and then they go and seek out a coach right so that's a good avenue but they're not getting that day-to-day -day conversation they're not getting those check-ins they're not even when you take a look at and i'm not knocking online programming because i mm -hmm. also do it right but you you only get to see a, a handful of lifts whereas um, even if I don't say something to an athlete that day, which would be rare, I still saw all of their lifts. And mm -hmm. then the next day they come in, I get to see a lot more lifts the next day. So I'm building like a lot more information because I'm seeing what they're doing in a, a large number of reps, as opposed to just a few here and there. And, and then we can make those adjustments, you know, right away. You know? Right. So, so uh, I'm a I'm a huge proponent of, of obviously coaching and having a coach in front of you. Yeah, and yeah. and and you know I've got athletes from all over. I'm, I'm working with an athlete in the UK. I've got an athlete. I've got athletes in San Antonio. I mean, it's people drive to come work with us. But yeah. if you don't have that ability, I, I would definitely you know enforce like going and finding a coach. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be this top level Olympian or anything like that. Just work with somebody local so that, you know, you can get that second eye on what you're doing. And it's yeah. very important because when you train by yourself or you go off YouTube or Reddit or whatever, you develop training scars and these things are harder to, you know, remove from your, your, your motor patterns than anything else. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can spend, you know, a year with an athlete just trying to like get rid of basic fundamental issues. And, mm -hmm. you know, if they, if they would have worked with the right coach or, or, you know, a coach at all, um, they probably wouldn't have had these problems. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the hardest things. And especially when you come across maybe somebody who's also really talented. So mm -hmm. you get a, you know, a guy or a girl in there that's already snatching and clean and jerking, you know, uh, probably like AO finals, national numbers. Right. But then they have some, you know, very clear technical flaws. And you have to be like, all right, now you're going to have to be patient enough because we're probably going to be taking steps back on the weight. Absolutely. You're going to be struggling for a little while and you're not going to be hitting those same numbers. That's going to be the difference between like getting you into nationals and then eventually getting you on the podium at nationals, you know? Yeah. The, the, the changes are always very subtle. Um, every session that we run, we try to focus on just a few things because that's yeah. all people can really think about anyways. Um, but I mean, you know, the difference within the way you dip or the difference within, you know, how the depth within the dip can be the difference of you, you know, getting silver or gold. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, dram it's dramatic. So yeah. you, you really need to look at those smaller details when you're at that level, especially with, if you're gifted with that sort of strength. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've had one athlete and maybe, maybe he'll be watching her. Um, he trained with us for about seven or eight months. He came in as a division one football player guy was mm -hmm. tremendous within the first three months. He had a three thirty total, like just <laughs> yeah. awesome. Uh, as coaches, we got really excited. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he just, he, he just couldn't tie it all together in terms of, you know, getting over the fact that he might be number two or three in the, in the state. And mm -hmm. he wants to, he wanted to compete for gold, you know, first time yeah. out. I'm like, listen, man, you gotta, you gotta learn from your mistakes and you gotta make those mistakes first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I kind of, I have to sometimes remind those really talented athletes that come in too, like, you know, you, for like lack of a better way of saying it, you almost also have to kind of pay your dues. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you got to You got to you. Even if you came from a, a very high level in another sport, there's still going to be a process coming into this sport, even though you can walk in and hit a 300 plus total right away. That doesn't mean that that you're going to just see this linear progression right. until you start taking the time to progressively make some changes let your numbers, you know, dial back a little bit for a while while those changes happen. And then, and then, yeah, you're not going to walk out there and be on the podium your first time. You're going to go out to, to maybe nationals and you're, you're in the bottom half, but then right. 
then a year or two later, you're in the top half. And then a year or two later, you know, you're gunning for a podium. Like that's just kind of the process. And I think a lot of times these, uh, yeah, these really high, uh, highly talented athletes, um, that's, that can be a tough process to, for them to realize, I'm still gonna have to put in probably six years in the sport mm. to really get where I wanna be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you know, for, for the athletes that are coming in, everybody's sort of blinded by, you know, these high level Olympians, you know, Lu Jajun and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Rastami and so forth. And I, I have to remind the athletes that are coming into the sport, either from powerlifting or other strength sports, that first and foremost, Olympic weightlifting is not a strength sport. You know, strength yeah. is a key factor to success, mm -hmm. but we need to think about overall athleticism. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, your balance, your coordination, your speed. I mean, all these things are, in my mind, even more important than putting more weight up, you know, I mean. Yeah, because... if it was primarily a strength sport, then we'd be seeing a lot more power lifters do really, really well. Right, right. I mean, so <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah. there's, there's been some research that, uh, that I attended um, in, in China, and they had one of their top, uh, 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 like, scientists speak to us. And they actually, you know, took numbers from, like, Ed Cohen and all these, like, top-level power lifters. And, like, if they were able to apply that strength, yeah. Into, into Olympic weightlifting, you would see a, a, a 500 kilo total plus. <laughs> and crazy. it's just, it's just like, it, you know, yeah. if you wanted to let yeah, the yeah. numbers speak for themselves. Um, we know though that like, you know, speed and all these other factors come into play and they probably yeah. wouldn't have the flexibility to do that. But you know, it's strength is not the only factor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, you're talking about your athlete. I came across through the uh, the USAW recruiting system. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent me a power lifter and uh, amazing guy, junior world records, um, you know, walked in the gym and put 700 pounds on the bar and squatted it, you know, mm. just just super strong guy. Um, he, he weighed about 160, um, but also very explosive, you know, he's right. very fast. He could do a 30 inch box jump, no problem um and uh and moved really well and through that kind of recruiting process they uh they do um i don't know if you've gone through that before but they do uh like uh scholarship type things yeah so there's the different like levels and if you meet a certain level um and at that time it was basically like hey if you think that this person could qualify for a national level meet within three months you know we'll pay his gym dues and his mm -hmm. membership so we were like, cool. Um, so I took him to the testing and I was like, yeah, he could probably definitely qualify for like AO finals in the next few months, but he's going to need a lot of work. And, uh, and it was, we, he qualified for AO finals, you mm -hmm. know, just kind of skated in there about, you know, five, 10 kilos above the totals. But then, then it like all kind of plateaued and and for him to be able to like come in every single day and only be working at this like 80% range yeah. for a long time ended up just being, uh, he was like thought that he was going to turn around and be doing 200 plus kilo, you know, clean and jerks right. within the first six months of training. And, and he did great. I mean, he, he clean and jerked like 170. He was able to jerk like in the one eighties and he was flexible. He was able to snatch in the one thirties. I mean, huge foundation, like total talent, but just couldn't put, just couldn't get him though to like commit the time to like stick with it. It's, it's all about reps at the end of the day. So yeah. you know, how many reps are you putting in? You need to, you, you need to show up for training. You need to listen to the coaches and it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating at times because you see some really talented individuals uh -huh. come up, come through and you know, some people, they just excel at certain sports because they're just gifted and, yeah. you know, maybe football or wrestling or whatnot. Um, and you can excel at this sport with, with gifts as well. You know, either yeah. you're, 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 you're blessed with the right torso size or your <laughs> arms are short, or maybe yeah. you're just, you know, naturally strong, but you know, ultimately you, you need to keep coming in for training. And mm -hmm. I know like training can be very monotonous and repetitive and, you yeah. know, it's up to the coach to sort of randomize things and make things a little bit more exciting. Yeah. Um, but this, this, is, this is a marathon. Like, you need to keep mm -hmm. going. You just can't just come in for the one race and expect to win gold and keep moving upwards. Yeah. Um, you know, I think any Olympic athlete or anybody that's competing at a high level would probably 
attest to the same thing. Nobody got into the sport, and then the next year they were, you know, qualifying for the Olympics. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and even those that did kind of come into the sport and, like, really quickly jump up really fast, mm -hmm. you we also still saw kind of like a little bit of that plateau at some right. point. Um, you know, like Kaiser Witt, you know, great athlete, but came in and all of a sudden he was like making international teams and then he kind of dropped off for a little bit. Right. Because it's like, okay, now it's time to really put in the time to to work on your lifts to get to that next level. And so you're right. Sometimes you can be gifted and jump in at a high level really, really quickly, but you usually don't see that increase in levels until you just put in the time to do the reps. Yeah, it's – it's uh. It's, it's, and, and that's where the coach comes into play to determine, you know, what is the right amount of reps to be, you know, to per mm -hmm. session per week. Um, you know, every athlete can, can take on a different, you know, amount of work capacity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's repetition. I mean, I hate to say yeah. it, it's, it's pretty simple. That's, that's the secret <laughs> people like that. That's yeah, yeah. it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if you want to get good at snatch and clean and jerk, you need to do a lot of snatch and clean and jerks. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. um, there's been research done where, you know, how many reps does it take to get to, you know, an Olympic athlete, you <laughs> yeah, know, with yeah. a snatch. <laughs> it's sort of like how many licks does it take to get the center of a Tootsie Roll pop? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and <laughs> it's like 30,000 reps you know yeah. of, so when they look at programming over the course of you know a decade that's what it takes yeah yeah then you know there was uh, an experience when we were early on where i had two of my athletes that you know and this was this was probably closer to like the 2014 time or something like that so weightlifting wasn't like as big as it is now Mm -hmm. And so these two athletes that I had, they were used to just like killing it on the local level. Every meet they showed up to, they were walking away with a medal and all this. And then we finally got them qualified for nationals. And then they went out to nationals and just got destroyed. Bottom of the pack, you know, and they're like, oh, this is completely different. This is like, this is a, a very different beast. And I'm like, yeah, you guys have only been doing this sport for a couple of years. Like that's, this is where you come in at, right. you know? I was like, I know you, you had all these high hopes on what you're doing in the local level, but then you move up a notch and you're starting at the bottom again. You move up a notch and you're starting at the bottom again. And then we did like, and then I ended up doing like an average of all of the, uh, the medalists at that nationals on how mm -hmm. long they've been in the sport. And then I'm averaging out somewhere at like seven, eight years. And some of them were upwards of like, they'd been in the sport for 12 to 15 years. And then there's a few that were, you know, the three, four years, but for the most part, it was like, yeah, it was like, you, you've got to, you got to put in the time now to slowly work your way up. It, it, and, and, you know, and I know that for, for the folks that are just sort of joining in that maybe haven't been training for a number of years, that, that might sound very, you know, depressing that you have to, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you could still have a ton of fun in this sport. And, mm -hmm. you know, you know, if you've been in, so I, I push my athletes to competition within the first three months, either a mock yep. meet or, or, or a local sanctioned meet. Yeah. And, and, and the goal is, you know, is to have fun, you know, to yeah. get, to get yeah. over that initial hump and then like, let's start training and, and put, put a method behind what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So if you go to that competition and you miss all three of your jerks, you know, we know what we need to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. The, the, it's like any sport, you know, and, and I think sometimes it gets muddled with like, uh, this is just like a, a, a strength program. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 we're playing a sport. Like, yeah. And for you to really get everything you want out of it, like any sport, you need to go, you need to practice and then you need to go play the game. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to get out there and you need to get on the competition platform. I talk about it business wise and uh, I can't, man, I'd have to go back and look at my numbers. But my retention, if I can get somebody to compete within their first three to six months, my retention rate for them is significantly higher than those that wait as long as, and wait until they're prepared right. to compete, you know? And, and, and we see the same thing. And, you know, business aside, you know, it's great when athletes stay on because, you know, we need to keep the lights on so everybody yeah. else can train. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's better for the overall sport. We want our athletes engaged. Mm -hmm. We want them to, you know, want to move forward. And, you know, we, we operate sort of in this team environment. So, you know, it, it being a part of that team and having others on your team cheer for you and help you along with yeah. the process is, is really kind of is critical. Um, and, you know, to your point with, you know, you have to play the game in order to understand you have to compete. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is, so we're, Shameless plug here. I'm running a comp in yeah. in August. 
Uh, we've, we've made, you know, huge sacrifices as a club from a financial level in order to buy the, the basically what they're doing at AO. Yeah. So we've got the, we've got a video screen, we've got the IWF competition platform and, you know, we want to give our athletes either in a mock meet or in a sanctioned meet, the same experience they would have when they go to a national meet so that they, they, they so when they get to a national meet, they're not frazzled or jittery yeah, or sure. anything else. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to us to make sure that, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to play on turf, you're going to train on turf. Yeah. 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 You sent me, um, you sent me some of the screenshots of y'all setup and it literally is, uh, like a national setup. Like, I mean, everything outside of maybe like the platform being raised up a few. Right. Feet. Yeah. We looked like, at that, but that was very expensive. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, and I would still say maybe a little unnecessary, but I mean, the background screen, um, you got the, the competition, the, the legitimate competition, you know, I, j I still just lay plywood at my meets. I mean, you see, so the feel of that floor is going to be very similar to the, to the competition floor at a national meet. And uh, I mean, to the scoring systems, to everything. And so it really does give the feel of what it's going to be like when you show up to your very first um, national meet. And in national meets now are a lot uh, more relevant than they used to be. Right. You know, once they implemented the AO series, uh, a, a huge amount of athletes that never could have gone to the American Open finals or nationals mm -hmm. are now being able to actually go out there and experience a national meet. And that first national meet's scary. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. And, there, and, there's, and there's subtle nuances with, you know, between like a plywood platform and, uh, and a full like, mm -hmm. you know, tongue and groove uh, four by four platform. And the things that athletes will notice when they when they go to or when they lift on one for the first time, either at AO or whatnot, is that in a tongue and groove platform, those those uh, layers are not even. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can't roll the bar to yourself and lift. You're going to have to walk up to the bar. There's, there's yeah. all these like little, little changes. The sound of the bar when it, when it drops is different. There's, and I know that's like very small it's, and, and it may, it may seem not. insignificant, yeah. <laughs> but man, if you're, if you only got three chances and you're sitting there and you're rolling that, that, that barbell to you and you're getting ready to lift, that's going to throw you off. Yeah. It's like, you know, it, it's like, uh, you know, losing the straps when you're getting ready for competition you know like right like it, there's a different feel to it you need to do it and uh i even try to make our athletes uh use the competition collars because it's a different sound yes. you know and so if you're used to hearing like that rattle you don't get that same sound when those weights are squeezed real there, tight there, there's a lot of there's a lot of small details in terms of like audible feedback the feeling on the bar in terms of tension mm -hmm. that change within competition and yeah. if you're not training in the same manner you're gonna have problems adapting yeah 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 it, it definitely takes some adjusting because then basically what you're left at um which is what a lot of our athletes have gone through the process of is you just have to make sure that you're trying to get on a national platform as often as possible right which is not easy it's, a, it's not easy yeah it's yeah, not exactly. easy you gotta you gotta qualify it's expensive i mean mm -hmm. there's like you got to make sure your coaches are taken care of to some degree. So it, it, it adds up over yeah, time. Yeah, it can be hard to try to hit a competition platform, you know, or, you know, a real national competition platform four times a year. You know, that can be yeah. most of our athletes are maybe one once or twice a year. And those are the ones that are very experienced with it. And so, yeah, so the, the opportunity that, that you guys are providing with that, I think, is really, really cool because, um, like you said, I mean, I, I don't do that at my meets because it's a huge investment it's a cost prohibitive I you know yeah. and so so for you guys to go out and say that we really want this kind of experience for our athletes and for other athletes at other gyms so that way they also not only have a really cool meet mm -hmm. um and the experience is fun but they're also going to have a pretty good glimpse of what it's going to be like when they do finally go to their first ao series or something like that Absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's intimidating when you walk onto something that's that big. It's like being alone on the stage. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it is, it is cost prohibitive. Um, I'm not going to get into like, you know, what pricing was, but I can tell you this, <laughs> it is probably the most stressful thing I've ever mm -hmm. done. You know, we basically took almost a half a year of, of membership dues to make this investment. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I basically gave it to a company in China to bring in for me. So That's it's, cool. it, it's, it's very, I mean, I, I saw the platform all the way from manufacturing to when it was getting bundled up on to get into a container. 
And, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen between here and China. I mean, it's like 5,000 miles, like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like I think could have fallen <laughs> off a ship that, you know, sure. there could have been a leak in the container. Um, so it was like sort of like purchase sight unseen, sort of. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, it showed up. It's in one piece. It's made out of Mongolian ash. It's, um, it's heavy as all hell. Yeah. The, each there's 10 there's 10 planks uh each plank is 125 kilograms and i know people are like oh i can lift 125 no problem yeah try, try, try to try to move it 50 feet <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a little different when it's not designed to be lifted perfectly <laughs> right exactly yeah. exactly um but it, it's a ton of fun it does take it does take an army of, of of athletes to to help us move it and you know we got a we got a tremendous um you know our volunteers are great i mean they've really yeah. you know helped us out and I, we, we couldn't be here without them so and not all of them are our current athletes sometimes it's family members or or, or parents or whatnot coming in but like we appreciate all the help it, it really yeah, helps awesome. us grow the sport and the more and the more of these that we can do in terms of competitions it raises awareness and then it'll help you know kind of escalate things forward and we yeah, need it absolutely. more now than ever so um, i mean that was part of the reason why almost as soon as i opened up my gym i started hosting meets because it, it does it pulls people into the sport it, it's, yes you know when when people are seeing the the game being played when people are seeing the competition like it's exciting you know yeah. it's the, the energy is completely different than just like a training day you know I mean, as, as a coach, it's like, that's the most exciting thing for me is to go to competition. Yeah. I mean, win, winning is awesome, but yeah. playing the game is even better. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, again, agreed. Winning is awesome, but I mean, it is just as fulfilling when you have somebody go to their very first meet and they go six for six and they're just ecstatic and they're like, when's the next competition? I mean, that is, you know, right. it's just as fun. Absolutely. So, so I know the last time we talked about, um, we, we, we started our conversation with competition and we talked a lot about like athlete prep and what to expect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, like, I, I think we wanted to sort of segue a little bit and start talking about, uh, you know, what it's like as a coach selecting numbers. Yeah. And, and I think that's like an important topic that, you know, is kind of overlooked. A lot of coaches come in and they'll either, you know, they're, they'll low ball, you know, their entry total and now they're mm -hmm. in the wrong session or, or, <laughs> or who knows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but you know, I think, I think it's a, it's a cool topic. I mean, if you're big into playing checkers or chess or connect oh, yeah. four, I mean, there's a lot of strategy involved. Um, and you know, every coach has it. I've been told I have my own tells, you know, mm -hmm. other coaches will watch me and they'll be like, I know what you're going to do because I've seen it before. Yeah. Um, but you know, you need to develop that long-term strategy. Like, so what yeah. you're doing in training is critical, but when you get to competition, most people aren't going to rise to the occasion. Like it happens, but like, you're not going to, you're not going to rise the occasion and like put four or five kilos, you know, over what your training max yeah. is. So as coaches, we need to think about, you know, dialing that back, thinking about, you know, how that athlete's progressively going to move forward. And then thinking about like the confidence level of that athlete as they're, you know, hitting each of the lifts. So it's always like an if, and so if this co if this athlete doesn't make the first lift, what are we faced with? You know, yeah. Now we've got the athlete, they're, you know, they're sort of, um, they're mentally out of the game because now they're, they're getting, you know, nervous about not making their next lift. There's a lot of tension that builds yeah, up. It changes a lot. Right. I mean, it's, it's only six lifts. So a lot is on the line on every single lift. Mm -hmm. And you almost have to have like a game plan for every single lift, whether you make it, miss it, and then how the athlete even responds to it. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, most most athletes when they when they walk with them on the platform, typically just I mean, at least the new athletes are like, did I make it? Did I? Is it good? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You know, because they're they're sort of lost in the moment, and, and there's a lot of adrenaline pumping, and and I get it. You know, we've all been there, and you know, we we are just doing what we've been programmed to do, and that's that's part of training. You know, just yeah, yeah. How many the times do you see uh, an athlete first time out there, and all of a sudden they PR their power snatch because they start they're pulling so hard, right. and they're drilling exactly. so high, and all of a sudden they powered, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They get excited, you know, being, you know, I caught the bar now I got to, I'm just going to take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, you know, one of the things that, that we go in with is we try to, we try to think about, um, we, we never, we, we always compete to win or at least place. We never mm -hmm. think about that athlete trying to hit these astronomical numbers unless there's a, you know, some sort of a state record or record that can be gained by it. And we want to accomplish everything within the first two lifts, generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So the third lift should be sort of a give me. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The third lift is when that's that can be either yeah a gimme or like the hail mary kind of thing right you right so, so like so. all right we've got you know you're sitting in second right now to take over first we're gonna have to do like an eight kilo jump you know it doesn't change anything whether you miss it but if you make it like, all right let's put let's put it on there you know so right. sometimes like that's that is definitely like the scenario um and, and i like what you said so yeah my as far as taking placements um i'm i'm also a little bit conservative uh and so i always make sure that if i have an athlete that is you know gunning for the podium mm -hmm. is i will always make sure that we first secure third place right and then we move them into second place and then we go for first place i'm never going to be like i'm going to risk not hitting the podium for first place yeah exactly you know? it, it, so you know <laughs> I guess there's those rare occurrences where like they, you know, their training total is, you know, how good they're, they've done, you know, leading up to the event, but they missed their first two lifts, which yeah, not a good situation to be in and by any means, yeah. <laughs> but so in that case, you might get a little risky. Cause I mean, you, 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 let's say you've tried for a hundred twice. They missed it, but you know, that athlete has one Oh eight in the bag, you know, at least yeah. in training. So you, you might, you might push. Um, but you know, there's also some strategies that you can do in the back room as you're getting the athlete prepared. In yeah. very in very seldom cases, and 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 I'm talking maybe one or two out of all the events that we've been to, I've had athletes sort of try to max out in the back before they hit the platform. It's not something that I'm a huge fan of. I, I definitely don't you know agree with like athletes hitting that one RM max and then go out and try to do it again. It's like chances of hitting that twice within you know one hour or even the same day is pretty minimal. Yeah. Um. But there there are some athletes that are out there. Uh, typically like in the functional fitness space, you know, they're just kind of used to that, that, that mindset. Yeah. And, and they, they've probably actually have trained taking their one RM mm -hmm. multiple times in a session anyway. Right. Exactly. Whereas, you know, usually in weightlifting, we don't do that, you know, maybe no. in a wave you might hit it a couple of times, but that's about it. It, it, exactly. So, you know, we're always like ramping that athlete up to, you know, just before they reach critical mass so that we can get them out into, you know, staging and then onto the platform yeah. within, you know, a couple of minutes or so. But, you know, as athletes, if, if an athlete starts to get cold, you can have them do a couple pulls in the back room. Um, you know, it, it's there's there's a couple of things you can do if you're in that situation where you've missed your first two and you need to you need to hit that third. Yeah. And and uh, and like what you said, to to even be able to give them something in the back if they have missed those first two, mm -hmm. to be able to do that it usually does mean that you're going to have to bump their next lift a little bit because right. if they're not, you're going to have to give them, you know, a, a good four or five minutes if all of a sudden we're going to go in the back and take a pull to, you know, to focus on something else to boost their, boost their confidence or just mm -hmm. to give them, uh, you know, where they didn't just miss. And now they're just sitting there waiting for their next lift. You know, they've missed two lifts. Do you really would just want them sitting there focusing on those two lifts? No, or no. do you want to bump their total a couple kilos knowing or bump their lift a couple kilos knowing that they're good for it and then take them over to the side, let them take a pull real quick and then clear their mind and then go back out there. A lot of times that's, that's all they need. They just need that little bit of a reset you know, mm -hmm. uh, so that way they can they can go out there and lift like they normally do. In, in, in most situations, you know, at least with the athletes that, that we train, you know, because like I said, most of our athletes have hit their their openers many times. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if they're if they've missed their opener and they missed their second lift, generally it's it's a little bit of headspace issues. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they're just not in the game or they're you know, something's different. So that's where as coaches, we need to, you know, not so much focus on, you know, the technique, maybe they have mm -hmm. issues locking out, but we need to focus on how do we, you know, kind of, how do we walk them off the ledge? Yeah. Yeah. There's good. There's, there should really be very few, like, like, you know, technique coaching going on, very little technique coaching going on at an actual meet. Mm -hmm. You're not training at that point. You're not trying to change anything. Now, giving them that cue that is something that, you know, maybe they normally have a technical issue. And so you go out there and you remind them real quickly, you know, make sure to finish your pull, you know, or finish hard, you know, something like that, just as that little bit of reminder. But you're mm -hmm. not you're just trying to remind them to be like aggressive at the top of their pull. You know, you're not or you're just giving them one small thing to focus on. 
to also distract them from the fact that they're on a competition platform. Right. So if you're right. just like set really tight when you pull, like all of a sudden they're just thinking about setting tight and it allows their body to kind of take over and their mind be focused on something else. It's, it's really in, 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 you know, the way I think about it, you get, you get one or two cues. That's it. Like yeah. going out there, you know, it's, it's, it's either, you know, punch hard, step out, lock, whatever. And it's, and it's those action cues. Like you just said, punch hard, you know, finish hard, you know, it's like you have to have these, just these quick action cues that don't, overload the mind right right yeah. exactly exactly um you know it's it's fight or flight you know in in those situations yeah. it, it really is so you don't really have a whole lot of time to stop and think about much maybe a little bit between the clean and jerk you know let's get them through the yeah. clean you know they're in the front rack position they're standing they've taken their you know first breath now we can talk to them a little bit and then they can you know execute yeah and if you were to like kind of talk to the athlete a little bit about anything technical your opportunity is during the warm-up phase you know, yeah, for sure. you're in those mid range numbers and you're like, hey, we need, you know, you need to fix this in your dip and, and then let them do that as they start leading up to their heavier numbers. So they make mm -hmm. that change early. And then because what you really want is you want those last two lifts on the warm up platform to feel really good before they go out there and hit that opener. They need, they need to be a bit of a confidence booster. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think we've all had those athletes like, you're looking good, you're awesome, you're a monster. <laughs> and then they get to their second to last lift right before they're supposed to go out on the platform. And, yeah. you know, they, they miss it or they, they drop from behind or whatever. And then you're kind of like, all right, let's, we don't have time to do another one. Yep. Let's, let's, let's talk through this and give you a couple cues so that when you go out there, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and like you said, a lot of times that's just like talking them down. You know, they go and they throw the barbell behind them. You're like, hey, I know you, you just missed that, but it, your pull looked strong. You had more than enough in the tank. You just got to, like, try to get their confidence up right before they go out to that platform, mm. and, you know, a, as opposed to letting them just sit there on this miss, you know? Right, right. I mean, it's, so, uh, you know, one of the things <laughs> that, that, that the competition is very good at um, just like a pandemic is exposing weaknesses. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, COVID exposed like all those issues that we have in this country. Um, and then, you know, train uh, competition will do the same thing. So if you've got deficiencies within your training, you're going to see those in competition. Yeah. If, if you're ignoring the yeah. fact that, you know, you're not, you're not taking the extra time to kind of connect mentally with what you're doing in certain movements, you're going to revert back to whatever bad habits or training scars mm -hmm. you've developed over the years. Um, so it's, 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 it's interesting to see that because typically you'll see these same things sort of like bubble up over time, over time. Yeah. Um, and then those things should take priority and emphasis as you're getting the athlete ready for the next training cycle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's good to always be able to have like that, you know, you go through a competition, all right, what did we learn from it, good mm -hmm. or bad? And then you, you always just kind of try to continue to roll that into the next one. But what they can also end up doing is they can start rolling that into their training too. Yeah. So we, we always do a postmortem, um, you know, so whatever yep. the result is of competition, obviously if they, they win a medal, we're celebrating, but we're also talking about what they could have done to improve. Yeah. And, and there's very few athletes out there where you can have that conversation and be like, Hey, good job. Everything is perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, where there's always like those small little knobs that you can tweak in order to make things just a little better. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you make things a little better, you get a few more kilos and a few more kilos, yeah. might be, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then over time, you start figuring out these little things in competition and that you can change. I mean, over time, it just starts to add up to like this perfect formula of I know exactly what I'm doing when I go into competition. I know exactly how my cut's going to go. I know exactly right. what I'm going to eat in between my lifts. I know exactly. And so not only talking about like the lifts and all that is uh, getting in there and also talking about, okay, um, how did you like the flow of warmups? And they might be like, I really want to warm up a lot quicker at the beginning and have more mm. time at the end. And then as a coach, you're like, perfect, noted. And so right. then, you know, so even as a coach, you can kind of like, figure out these things to set that athlete up for the, the best uh, competition that they can have. And then when they're used to uh, things like um, what they're used to in training, they're like, I always have my pre-workouts right before this. And then all of a sudden they go to competition and they don't do that or they don't eat between, yeah. like they're, you know, they've got this huge span and their adrenaline's been up and their energy all of a sudden dropped. 
and they're used to having food and they don't have food. So it's all these like little things that just kind of like add up to uh, that, that don't get thought about maybe a, for an early athlete in the competition. That if you do these post competition things, you can be like, all right, let's make sure we do this next time. Let's make sure we do this next time. And, uh, and so just like competition, it's repetition. <laughs> you know, or just, like training. just yeah. like training, it's repetition. The more competitions you do, the better you're going to be at competition. Typically, you know, by your by your third or fourth competition, you know, most people start to get into the kind of yeah. the groove of things. Uh, you know, I'd also say like, you know, make a habit of competing at different venues also. Mm, so yeah, that's yeah. also critical. So, you know, I see a lot of people, they'll go back and forth to the same gyms over and over to compete. And that's very cool. And it's supported. Um, yeah. But it's going to be a shock to your system the first time you, you hit a venue with different athletes that you're competing against in a different city or a different, <laughs> yeah. or a different part of the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, you're not used to maybe having a, a big crowd right in front of you mm -hmm. and now you do. And then, yeah, it's like a, so many things can change. The warm up areas are different. Some are more packed, some are more right. spread out. And you're, you're, you're warming up on different bars. I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, my athletes <laughs> notice is like when they go to AO, it's like, you know, the, the bars are all very high quality. And I, and I think we use great equipment in our gym as well. Yeah. But the, they use the Pyros bar for warm up, and, it, and it's, a, it's a slightly aggressive barbell. You know, yeah, and it's like, yeah. you know, they're warming up, they're bleeding in the shins. It's <laughs> yeah. like, um, it, yeah. it takes a little bit of time to get used to. So yeah, and, and not let those things get to you as an athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a decent bar, you're gonna do fine. <laughs> What, yeah. One of the one of the one of the I think the funniest things that I've come across is I had an athlete uh, first time at AO, I think we were in Daytona. And you know, we were we were next to a platform with uh, uh, Travis Mash. And he was yeah. just like, he, he couldn't get over the fact that, you know, one of, one of his, <laughs> yeah. you know, coaching idols was on the platform next to us. I'm like, hey, man, bring yeah. it back down. Let's, let's, let's focus on what you're here to do. And then we can go talk to him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like, it's, so even distractions like that are, are interesting to see. So absolutely. Yeah. I've had to turn an athlete to face the other way before because they had an international athlete warming up right in front of them. Yeah. And yeah. they couldn't stop focusing on that. Or they're afraid that they're going to like look bad in front of that person. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. I get it. It's like, you know, put your put your tongue back in. Yeah, yeah, let's, exactly. Let's like it's it is cool. It's a good experience, you know, enjoy it. But we're here to, to lift weights. Yeah, you know, focus on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as far as like, also on the coaching side of, uh, of meets, um, something that I don't do that I thought was cool, I talked to uh, Camargo about a little bit, mm -hmm. is we usually, you know, I, I have a form that they fill out before they do a competition. And it's like, you know, uh, warm up attempts, what do you plan on hitting? You know, do you want trap slaps and, you know, all this kind of information. Right. And so that way I have at least a basic template for an athlete, but also if I have to have another coach, coach one of my athletes, mm -hmm. I have something I can give them so that they have an idea of what's going on. Um, but something that I don't ever really talk to my athletes about is um, if things don't go perfectly, mm -hmm. how do you want me as a coach to respond to you? Like if you, um, if you miss all three snatches, do you want, you know, do you need some time on your own? Do you right. want me to like get you, ex you know, excited about clean and jerk? Like, you know, after a, you know, a bomb out, how do we want to address that? Even though you don't really want to like talk about missing lifts before yeah. a competition, sometimes maybe with a new athlete, it might not be a bad idea to be like, hey, if you miss your opener, you know, uh, do you want me to get you psyched up? Do you want to try to take a lift in between? Like what, mm -hmm. what kind of game plan would help you the most if we kind of get into these sticky situations? And I, I think, I think that's all very important. And, you know, I, I and, and we're, we're definitely not doing that. And maybe it's something we should consider because, oh. you know, I, I've also seen athletes that'll go through competition for the first time and they're like, not for me. And it's like, why? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I bombed out or whatever. And it's like, you know, it's very stressful. Yeah. And, you know, people, especially in a, in a, in a tight training environment, they'll, they'll become emotionally invested in the team, the group, the family, mm -hmm. you know, like everything that's going on, you know, within the, within the club itself. And then they go out to competition and either they fail themselves or they fail the club or whatever. And, yeah. and I, th and I think, you know, the most important thing is, you know, if, learn from your mistakes and yeah. you know I, I i hate to see when people just sort of like get up and quit it happens yeah. but you know it's it's like as a coach you think back you're like what could i have done differently how mm -hmm. could i have you know touched this person in a way where you know they would have been able to or connect with them rather 
and, you know, how they could have, uh, you know, gone out, performed differently, how I could have a- addressed that situation after they come in. And everybody's different. I mean, and I think as coaches, we sort, we know our athletes pretty well. Yeah. Um, and the way that we do our divide, or at least pre-COVID when we had a, a larger athletic base or athlete base is that we had, you know, assigned coaches for specific groups of athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, those athletes with those coaches are very in tune with how they train, you know, uh, some athletes, you know who you are, you talk too much when you're on the platform when you're training and like, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of like nuances and, and sort of tertiary information that comes off of it. But yeah, I think that's very important to, to kind of ask the athlete up front and try to, un- try to understand like, you know, how am I going to push the right buttons if you, in case you, things don't work out. Yeah. And I'm still kind of like on the edge, whether I want to have that competition, that, that conversation before a competition. Mm. But uh, so because like you said, I know most of my athletes and most of my athletes have been competing for a while, but it might be worth that conversation with, uh, you know, the first time athlete or something like right. that, but, um, or their first time going to nationals, like, you know, how do we want to handle this? Um, but uh, you had mentioned a second ago that, uh, and, and I think uh, something that's, you know, we maybe as coaches forget about is a lot of times those athletes at that point just need to lean on their team. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of times the team steps up and is like, oh yeah, you know, I went to my first nationals and I bombed out and you know, it happens, but then you just, you just use it as a motivator. And so they start getting like this good information from all your more experienced athletes or the team and the team kind of makes them feel better. And, uh, and I think that's a big part of like being able to also have that team you know, and, and people that you, you trust and look up to within your team that can probably step in in areas where coaches don't always need to be, you know, playing the role of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm very big on making sure that we communicate well within the group, our, you know, ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, we run, you know, probably what most clubs are doing, you know, WhatsApp group or whatnot. But I mean, in, in general, I, I think, you know, we're pretty, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty open and transparent with, with how we, we, you know, talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, in, in general, you know, I think most of the athletes in my club would step up and, you know, try to, you know, make somebody feel more confident if they were to fail yeah. for whatever reason. I mean, it, it happens, but it's, it's, you know, it's unfortunate. So yeah, yeah, going through that. I mean, that's always such like a, a, a gut feeling though, as a coach. You know, like, like nothing's more like, it's probably harder on us sometimes to like have to sit there mm-hmm. on the sideline and just be like, all right, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, hoping that they just hit that lift. So, you know? so, <laughs> so something else I've been making my athletes do, and, and this may be, maybe I'm too much of a boy scout is after a competition, I always ask my athletes, no matter what the result is, like go out and congratulate your winners and your competitors. So mm-hmm. game well, game well, game well played. And yeah. go out and congratulate the winners, no matter what your result is. Um, I think it's like important, that. you know, for yeah. for sportsmanship. You know, I we we train our children to do this in, in like a soccer yeah. game or whatever. Yeah. And I and I feel like you know, and and I've got athletes that are like, I hate that person. I'm not going there. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. then be the bigger person and go over there and congratulate exactly. them. Exactly. For... Exactly. Yeah. No, I think that's good. I mean, obviously, a, a lot of our athletes just do it because you know they are good sportsmen but I, I like the fact that that's kind of something that you've also implemented i think that's something that i'll i'll definitely steal from you a little bit i think that's uh, uh you know like you said it's it's showing good sportsmanship and you want that athlete to to come out there and want to beat you but also you know you want it to be a good competition too right you, you want you know like hey sometimes it's just like you know they they showed up they outlifted me you know as opposed to being as opposed to like having that poor relationship from athlete to athlete and it's just you know you get this rough dynamic and who knows when that athlete's going to show up at your gym and do a yeah, shot yeah, or something yeah for sure like that for sure <laughs> i mean it, it's 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 pretty obvious that like and from and everything that i've seen in my club and other clubs like you know when you register for a meet and you're a you know an 81 that's between the age of 40 and 45, you're probably on Instagram or first, first stop is USAW. Yeah. <laughs> you're yep. looking at all the rankings. You're like, okay, yeah, yeah. this person's in Texas. He's on the start list. I'm going to go to Instagram or Facebook and, yeah. and see if I can find his lifts. So, you know, these, these are your peers. They're not, I mean, I know you're competing against them, but like, 
you know, we want those people that we either beat in competition or that beat us to come to the next one. You know, that's yeah, how the absolutely. sport grows and that's how and everybody wins. Yeah, it's really important. I mean, it's important for us, especially as like gym owners who host meets. It's like we need people to want to come to our meets. We need people, you know, and that, mm -hmm. that also lies on the athletes that we train. You know, if we're going to go out there and show good sportsmanship and show up to meets and, you know, act right, then people are going to want to come to us and support us and help us out. And, uh, and you're right. There's, uh, you know, yes, we have competition, but we're also, um, we're also all Texas weightlifting, which yeah. is important. We need mm -hmm. that to grow. We're all, uh, you know, USA weightlifting, and mm -hmm. we need that to grow as to also support us. You know, it's not just us against everybody else. You know, there, there's more going on. <laughs> I mean, my, my mindset in the last, you know, three to four months has is, is sort of changed a little bit. You know, like, I, I want to help other gyms succeed because mm -hmm. I feel as if, you know, if you're building your athlete base, my base is going to move as well. Yeah. And, you know, every, everybody's going to, you know, win at the end of the day, you know, it, it is, it is a little bit of business at the end of the day, but you know, we want, you know, we want a, a healthy community and that Agreed. community, it, it goes beyond the walls of just one gym. Agreed. Yeah. And, you know, I've said it before, I'm not going to be exactly what somebody wants. Mm -hmm. And I would rather them, you know, find a coach and be involved in weightlifting than just, you know, you know, get out of it because their experience with me wasn't exactly what they wanted. Right, right. Because I agree, we if all of weightlifting's coming up, it's still going to help us. Uh I mean, it, it, as coaches, you know, I've been called judgmental, you know, I'm not very compassionate at times. Like there's a lot of <laughs> things that, I, that I'm not, but there's also a lot of things that I are that I am. But if, if you know, if I'm not, if I don't have the right coaching style for you, or if one of my coaches doesn't have the right style for you, then, you know, I'll, I'll help you find another club. Like I'm yeah. cool with that. It's fine. Yeah, like I, 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 I would rather have you go somewhere else and succeed and perform than stay in my club and not really, you know, progress or be negative. Agreed. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it's the same thing with athletes that, you know, maybe leave the club to go try something else. Mm -hmm. I was like, you don't want to, you, you know, you, you need to maintain some kind of like healthy relationship with everybody in weightlifting, because if they go out and they experience something and it's not what they're looking for, they also need to feel good and welcome to come back and say, you know, I, I, I you know, I kind of went out there, I tried some other things this is still best for me, you know, right. uh, you know, and so I find even as a, a club owner, um, there's, you know, always leaving on good terms. And I mean, some of that obviously comes down to the athlete too. I mean, they need to be responsible. It's like, you know, having the conversation with the coach, you know, right. Like, of course, you know, you know, but you know, as a coach, um, being supportive of them trying to do the best thing for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 you know, I think it's also important to say that, you know, you might as an athlete, you know, some coaches connect better with some athletes than others. So, yeah, you know, if, if, if you're working with one coach and that coach, you know, you reach a certain level and you sort of plateau and then you might need to connect with somebody else, maybe a different perspective or a different training mm -hmm. style in order for in order to push you over to the next level. We've seen this with professional athletes. You know, you've got, uh, you mentioned Carmago, amazing coach, amazing man. Yeah. You know, I've met him before. I've had conversations. I like his style, but you know, at some point, you know, sometimes you just need to change. It's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I've even sent some, you know, athletes, I'm like, Hey, this is a sticking point. Go work with this person for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they'll go do like, you know, a couple of weeks at another gym and be like, yeah, they cued me a little bit different and it really helped, you know, and sometimes that's self where they go and drop in somewhere and they're like, this coach, you know, somebody comes into Austin Barbell from our club and he said X, Y, Z and, and it transfers over. And as a coach, you need to be confident enough to like allow some of that information to trickle into your athlete if it helps the athlete, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, I hope that every one of my athletes becomes a coach. I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's, that, that's what I'm trying to teach them yeah. is like how to identify, you know, the, the, the deficiencies within themselves and others, observation, looking for those small details, and then being able to figure out ways to correct them. That's, that's the goal at the end of the day. So if they can coach themselves and they can coach others, then I've done my job. Yeah. It looks like we got about 45 seconds. Oh, left. okay. Yeah. Um, real quick though, you, the dates for your competition. 
August 1st, August 2nd, two day event. Uh, we're running four sessions on day one. We got three sessions on day two. We're considering a second session. So there's still openings. Um, so sign up for the wait list and we're basically taking first come first serve and we're just approaching it that way. So it's going to be a blast. It's going to be awesome. awesome. Thanks a lot, dude. Appreciate yeah, you. Thank you. Appreciate right, it. Bye. Bye-bye.